Bom dia. Good morning. One and all. We're beginning our long awaited roundtable on foresight policies and uh, pandemics, launching the book Foresight for Science, Technology, and Innovation, the Portuguese translation. Before we begin with Juliano and Val de Leia, I'd like to make some acknowledgments and beginning with this Science Without Borders program, this event that we're holding today and this book, both of them are the direct results of investment in the Science Without Borders program in the PhD program that I did at the University of Manchester with Professor Ian Miles, who was my uh, supervisor. So as a result of this interaction, we're launching this book in Portuguese as a feedback to Brazilian society for the investment made by the Science Without Borders to generate knowledge and giving feedback to Brazilian society, not just this event here. This is one of the events and one of the uh, products. Another acknowledgement that we want to make, which is prior somewhat to Science Without Borders, and Dr. Wagner Martins and Fiocruz in Brazil with the Center for Intelligence in Brasilia under Fiocruz. He invited me first years ago, 10 years ago, to work with Foresight in the period when he was the di former director of planning, the coordinating division of planning at Fiocruz, the Oswald de Cruz Foundation. So before I continue, I have a recommendation here. We have two different links. If you're on YouTube, if you want to listen in English, there's a link in English. If you want to listen in Portuguese, there's a link in Portuguese. So for the broader audience, you can choose the languages, choose whichever link you wish in the either of the two languages. So I also wish to thank the authors of the book, Professor Ian Miles, who was my thesis supervisor at the University of Manchester, and he's a professor emeritus of U of Manchester and economics at the HSE in Moscow. And he has several articles published and he's a well-known author in this field and here in Brazil, including in Brazil. Dr. Oskan Saritas is a professor of strategy, strategic planning at the Higher School of Economics in Moscow. He is a senior researcher at the Manchester Institute of Innovation, Research and Innovation, and he's an editor-in-chief of the journal Foresight, one of the main journals in this field of futures studies. And Dr. Alexander Sokolov is the director of the strategic, uh, HSSC at the National Research Institute in HSC, Director of International Foresight at the HSE. He is the author of more than 120 different publications as well. He has numerous interactions and in international projects and consultancies. And I wish to also thank them. Valdele Veloso and Juliano Valdele is the director here of the National Institute of Infectious diseases and for years she's been heavily involved in planning and she acknowledges the importance of strategic planning for the hospital's work for years we've known each other before i came here to work she used to invite me before she invited me to work here at the uh, uh, office and juliana as well who was my former boss when we worked in the former planning office here at the Oswaldo Cruz Foundation. He was one of the people who organized at that occasion about 15 years ago, the Office of Planning. It was organizing the Office of Planning at that time in the Oswaldo Cruz Foundation. You're all welcome. Welcome to the speakers in the audience. And I would like to turn the floor over to Juliano Lima. Without further ado, you have the floor now, Juliano Lima. Thank you, Valji. Good morning, one and all, ladies and gentlemen. I wish to salute my colleague and dear friend, Valji, 
Air Mead, he's the head of planning here at our National Institute of Infectious Diseases. Evandro Chagas Greet, Dr. Valdelea, who's my friend and dear colleague here at the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation. She's, she's the head of our hospital, our institute. I want to thank our guest speakers, Ian Askan and Alexander, the authors of the book, which we are launching today officially and who honor us with their presence. I also wish to salute and greet our editor in the publishing house here at Fiocruz, who are responsible for publishing this. We're proud because of their work in disseminating scientific knowledge in the various different fields of health and science and technology and health. This is another contribution made by the publishing house here, the in-house publishing house. It's very timely, the version of the book in Portuguese, Foresight for Science, Technology and Innovation is being launched in Brazil in partnership with Fiocruz and with the National Institute of Infectious Diseases. Fiocruz is the institution, scientific and technological institution in the health field. It's the most outstanding one in Latin America as a whole. It has an extremely important role in policy making and development of activities focused on improvement of living condition and health conditions in the Brazilian population. And the foundation defends steadfastly that the past for development with social justice needs to be based on a tripod that includes health, science, and education. This tripod, tripod, three things that few crews for 121 years has dedicated its work to uh, conducting. In addition, Fiocruz is at a very unique moment in its history now with decisive action in confronting the COVID-19 pandemic. This pandemic has raised numerous issues related to foresight, how much we could have avoided the pandemic, how much we could have faced it and tackled it better if some recommendations, foresightful recommendations had been followed or taken seriously by governments. But Fiocruz was able to quickly organize and respond effectively to the pandemic. And the recognition has come from all segments of Brazilian society. This week, Fiocruz has received the makes a different award from the O Global mainstream newspaper, which just reads the uh, Federal Accounts Court Award. And next week, Nisa Trindad will receive the National Order of the Legion of Honor from the French government in recognition of her action and that of Fiocruz, obviously, in confronting this epidemic. The book today that we're launching today, Foresight for Science, Technology, and Innovation, makes a priceless contribution to this moment in Brazil, not only that of health in Brazil, but to the country as a whole. We are in the midst of an unprecedented crisis in Brazil, a political, economic, health, environmental, and humanitarian crisis. Everyone is monitoring and following the protests in Brazil of the indigenous peoples against the uh, invasion of encroachment on their territories and this, the health for all has said that we will not overcome this crisis if we are uh, shackled to this approach, the political situation. It's a moment for analysis, but we cannot, it cannot be the uh, guide our action, the political crisis, the thinking and action needs to be oriented by towards the future that we want to build. Without a doubt, scholars in the field of planning and science and technology and innovation, these researchers gain now the opportunity to have access to one of the most solid studies in the field of foresight, which will contribute greatly to the work in policy making and implementation of policies in Brazil and to research in the field of planning and futures studies. Finally, I could not fail to congratulate the National Institute of Infectious Diseases, the INI here at Fiocruz, but especially salute my friend Valdir Ermida for his effort and brilliant work 
with his PhD dissertation and for having been responsible for having today available to the Brazilian public this book in Portuguese, the Portuguese translation. So I wish to thank you for uh, allowing me to make these opening remarks and let's move on now. Thank you very much, Juliano. And without further ado, I want to turn the floor over to Dr. Valdelea. Uh, Valdelea, you have the floor. Good morning, one and all, ladies and gentlemen. It's a huge pleasure to share and participate in the book launch in the Brazilian edition of Foresight for Science, Technology, and Innovation. I wish to salute here and congratulate our the authors of the book, Ian Miles, Askan Saritas and Alexander Sokolov for sharing with us so generously this moment and giving us the opportunity now to have the book's authors with us who have brought us a huge contribution and the translation of this book into Portuguese by a person from the field, i.e. Valdir Ermide is extremely important it's not Portuguese and not a language which we have many works translated into the Portuguese language. And in Brazil, there are not that many people who are fluent in English, fluent enough to be able to properly uh, take full advantage of the content of this kind of book, which you can realize that it takes longer and to have this work translated into Portuguese is essential for us in that sense. I wish to also say that Valdir made the, acknowledge the Science Without Borders program in Brazil and the fact that he shared time during his training with you three and the knowledge they acquired and that experience immediately applied such knowledge when he came back to Brazil uh, and has been contributing since then. And I quickly invited him for him to head our planning office and you can see here in the behind Valji is our banner from strategic planning for the National Institute of Infectious Diseases. For the first time, we have a longer time horizon, 2018 to 2030, based on also Valji's experience with uh, foresight. The National Institute has a tradition of working with strategic planning and it's improved and enhanced this work in the last edition of our workshop for strategic planning. It's great to work with scenarios and incorporate different actors into our workshops. And I believe that this book includes examples and it highlights the importance of us having specialists, these experts, and even lay people as well. And I would say, I consider myself a lay person. People who participate are lay people, although they have technical backgrounds, they're physicians, researchers, but we had the opportunity to work with representatives of civil society as well in the workshops. And it was a very enriching workshop. It was one of the points that you highlight in the book. So this book that you systematize the knowledge in this field, I can say that it makes a major contribution. It's a book that you read and it flows easily with practical examples, systematizing knowledge and giving guidance and orientation for us to incorporate this into our own practice. And the book will contribute greatly for us to make further progress in foresight, and as Giuliano highlighted so well, we could not be stuck in the current moment. We have a lot of immediatism and looking towards the future is essential. And the future begins now with what we need to do to reach where we want to go. Especially here in Brazil, we need for that to happen. We have to make crucial steps it's a difficult moment for all of us now in Brazil, but the future can be a much better and foresight can bring us a way to reach this future better. Thank you very much, Valdele, for those wonderful words. 
Before I move on, I, Juliana touched on the point, which is the issue of the publishing house here, the in-house publishing house. Our Jean Canas is the editor in chief of the publishing house and his entire staff who were very helpful in the entire process. We couldn't have done it without them. So moving on now, I'd like to turn the floor over to Professor Ian Miles to begin the presentation of the book after whom it will be Askan Saritas and finally Dr. Alexander Sokolov. So Ian Miles, you have the floor. Do us the honor. Thank you very much. And um, it's um, my honor very much. Uh, we're, we're very, very um, proud to be published by Theo Cruz, especially because now Theo Cruz has been playing such an important role um, in fighting the pandemic. And of course, the pandemic is on everyone's mind now. Um, and it is a continuing issue, but it is also a symptom of many things that are wrong with the world today. Um, so seeing you address it so thoroughly is really, really important. So thank you very much for this. Thanks to Fio Cruz. Thanks to Fio Cruz Publishing House. Thanks to Valdia for the immense work he did on translation. I know this was a great effort. Um, and uh, thanks to Science Without Borders as well uh, for, for the support. Um, I like the very much the introductory remarks we've heard from everyone. Um, Giuliano Lima um, talked about links between foresight and futures thinking and the pandemic. Um, and I think we will come back to that often in this discussion um, because there is a great deal of light cast on problems with foresight, problems with the use of futures thinking uh, by the experience of the pandemic. Um, and we see that in both cases that we need to have, you know, what is called a systems view. I think Ozjan may talk about this as well. Um, the need to understand how things are so closely linked together, um, including, of course, how the pandemic is very much linked with um, uh, global issues, geopolitics, with our modes of production and the uh, intrusion of uh, our uh, economic activities into wilderness areas and um, you know into interference with um, uh, uh, life forms in many places um, and uh, we you know some people are talking about saying you know this is not really a pandemic it is a syndemic uh, it is uh, something that involves the interaction of all sorts of uh, different matters epidemiological matters social matters economic matters and the like um, and I also uh, very much appreciated what Vadele Veloso had to say about strategic planning, um, an area closely related to foresight, of course, but we, an area where we can each learn from each other. Um, and an area where, of course, we're concerned with trying to make the future better, uh, as she said, um, not just to predict what will happen, uh, but to try to inform our current activities. Our activities today are influencing the long-term future, of course. We need to think about the long-term future in order to choose the right things to do. And this book um, is an effort to try to demystify some of this. We're not coming to tell you what to do as the experts from outside who have the answer to all problems. We're trying to share some of our experience with using these approaches and methods to deal with problems and mainly the book focuses on science, technology, and innovation. Um, but I believe that many of the approaches and principles can be used in other respects as well. Um, so at the core of our foresight approach, um, there are what I, I like to call the three Ps. You see the diagram behind me. Uh, perspective, long-term analysis, uh, links to actual decisions that are being made in policy, um, and participation. Um, and by participation, we mean many things. We mean bringing in um, more than just narrow experts um, into the area. Um, uh, and the pandemic is a good case in point. We have 
had um, problems because epidemiologists have been very good at some sorts of modeling, um, but they haven't been able to deal with a lot of the behavioral issues that have come into play in the course of the pandemic. Um, that people will make choices about which of the recommendations to follow. Uh, and that's not just policymakers, it's the general public as well. Um, yeah, right now in this country, I'm talking from the UK, um, we have uh, had an end to the uh, legal restrictions on many of our behaviors. Still, 90% of people are wearing masks some of the time um, when they go to the shops, when they go to public places. Um, this is, you know, complete change in behavior and it was not expected by the modelers. Um, and there are many, many examples of this. We've needed to bring in behavioral scientists of various sorts to understand the process of, of what is going on in this immediate crisis. And the same is true in foresight work. When we're looking at issues of science, technology, innovation, we typically have to bring into play several experts in the field, um, several experts in wider fields that are related to the particular topics we're looking at, and various other stakeholders who can tell us about how different parts of society, how different parts of the economy, how different institutions are liable to react and respond to events uh, as they evolve. Um, so what really differentiates foresight work from a lot of other future thinking is this effort to, to bring thinking about the long term um, into contact with actual decisions that are being made, not just to be policy relevant, but to be policy related um, and to involve participation, to bring in more people, both to give knowledge and inform the process and to have more people understand the process and be able to take the results uh, and the lessons that come from this foresight thinking. Um, back into the world, into the communities they come from, into the um, organizations that they come from, so that it's not just a matter of having a written report telling you what we think may happen or may not happen in the future. It's a matter of people having a much enhanced understanding of how the system works, of the different elements of the system that are driving the future um, and that are forging our choices for the future. And, th and that really is, the, is the, the, the main message of the book. We, can, we need to do this. Um, we have various tools and techniques that we can bring into play. And Özcan, I think we'll talk about some of the process and the stages um, that we go through uh, in foresight work. Um, but uh, this is the, the core of our message. And Coming back to what Giuliano Lima said, you know, what we have seen, and the pandemic makes this very, very clear, is that a lot of long-term thinking is not properly taken into account um, in decision-making. Many of our uh, political leaders are very, very much focused on the short term, uh, maybe onto doing things that are popular, um, not in taking into account uh, longer-term challenges. But we are uh, in a era of now where there is so much crisis going on, um, not just the pandemic, not just geopolitics, but in particular the climate crisis and a number of other ecological challenges that are confronting us, um, that we cannot afford uh, to ignore these long-term issues. Uh, so we then have the big question of, well, what can we do to make our organizations and our political systems more responsive to these things and more capable of dealing with them. Um, and our book is, is a very, very small contribution here. We're trying to demystify some of the methods and techniques to show that it's not a matter of having a guru come from outside and tell you what is going to happen and what you have to do. That it's a matter of being systematic in thinking about these things and embedding these things into decision making and developing the capabilities to do this and basically training people in what is now UNESCO calls futures literacy um, is extremely important. And I think that is my main message. I could go on talking forever on these things, but um, 
the the core point the core points I think have come out, and I very much welcome again. I would say I'm very grateful for the opportunity we have to uh, expose this work and and to be in dialogue with you people who are practitioners um, in one of the most important fields uh, for the long term thinking. So thank you very much. Well, I guess it's my turn now. Obrigado, Ian. So, uh... é, ok, Oscar. Palavra sua. Siga lá. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Elder. So, well, um, I would like to begin uh, with saying that uh, I joined Ian for all the, um, well, uh, you know, good um, wishes he made actually for the ones who spent effort for this book. So it was a great, excellent work. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, Welder for uh, bringing us here together um, and taking this initiative of uh, translating this book into Brazilian and Portuguese and uh, basically helping us to get to a wider audience. If there's any single person actually reading this book after this translation, I'll be more than happy with that. So well, every single person who is reading this book in this new language, Brazilian Portuguese, will make me happy and then much more pleased. Um, and then, of course, everyone else who uh, took a lot of time and effort uh, to bring this book together and then giving us a chance to launch it today. So that's, that's my great pleasure. Um, so Ian actually gave a very good uh, introduction to the rationals of uh, bringing together uh, such a book and then presenting it to a wider community. So this book wasn't written uh, necessarily as a textbook for the ones who study foresight or who learn about it, but uh, it was mainly written to bring together uh, all the stakeholders, create a platform, and then give some uh, instruments uh, in terms of thinking about the future. So that is actually what we try to achieve. And there's, as Ian said, years of experience behind the, this book. So in Manchester, in UNIDO, for example, we had a great experience working with UNIDO, also in Moscow recently. So this thinking process is still going. And this book was a snapshot of where we were uh, when we first uh, wrote it a couple of years back. So the process continues. So we will continue improving that. And this latest pandemic has shown us why it's necessary more than ever to think about the future and to take some necessary actions before actually this sort of threats arise. Uh, because we were talking about the pandemics many years ago um, as a wild card, but we always knew that actually this wasn't a wild card, but this was a now event. So it was known unknown. So we knew that the pandemic would come. It is there. It's a fact. And in Brazil, for example, you have a great experience in dealing with pandemics and epidemics and pandemics in previous years. And I'm glad that actually you um, as a team have the opportunity to bring this experience to fight with COVID-19. And I greatly appreciate your uh, efforts uh, there at your um, institute. So uh, as Ian said, our book actually uh, doesn't talk about only why we should think about the future, but it doesn't also say what needs to be done. It aims to give some necessary instruments on how we can deal with these uh, issues, because there's not one clear answer for all the questions and all the grand challenges we have. But what we try to do is give some kind of an orientation with some processes and instruments and then try to give some examples of them so that you can take this as a guide to find your answers for your future. Of course, we have a common future globally and we need to think about that and put our heads together. And that's why I greatly appreciate this day effort, signs without borders. It's very exciting, actually. I uh, also congratulate everyone who worked on this effort. So this is great. I'd like to actually stay in touch with the team 
and then promote science everywhere because we need to develop science without borders and we need to develop futures also without borders because we are living on the same planet which is very small as we see and which is very also complex and also systemic. So we are talking about the pandemic, for example, today and the pandemic, we quickly realized that it's not a simple health issue. Of course, it is triggered by a health problem, but then it has consequences on society, on economy, on politics, and we will probably see many more consequences. So systemic thinking is very, very important. And this is what we try to emphasize in our book also. And also we try to emphasize systemic thinking when we um, formulate the way we look into the future. So uh, if I can share a, one slide very uh, quickly. So this is uh, a model that we use in this uh, process, which we call this the four star uh, model. So um, as you see, there are processes in foresight. So foresight is not simply thinking about the future. So foresight is a process which begins with the initiation of the activity as a project. So it needs to be done as a project with clear goals, with clear objectives, with uh, outputs and outcomes expected from the beginning, with some processes, milestones and outputs generated at the end of the process. So this process needs to be planned. So here is a four star model, which begins with the organization of the activity, scoping and creating a foresight culture in society and embedding foresight in our policy making and decision making processes continues with intelligence. This is about scanning and looking and understanding trends and developments in our world. So what are those trends shaping our future? What are those drivers of change, for example, pushing us to change our behaviors? And then we look into the future. This is the creative part of foresight because we are not actually trying to predict the future. We are trying to create the future. So the future has to be designed and there's a great deal of creativity and imagination involved in that there's a great deal of uncertainty in front of us and a great deal of complexity, but this is not necessarily a bad thing. So this gives us a chance to design our future. And this is where imagination and creativity come into the picture. And again, we don't only create some future images, scenarios and future outlooks, but we also articulate this to build some visions. So what is desirable for the future? and what is undesirable also. And then we build some pathways in order to achieve those visions, in order to get to that desirable future for everyone. So this is the interpretation phase where we connect the future with the present. We don't only, as I said, plan the future and leave it there because future is planned and designed to be acted. So that is why we try to connect the future with the present. And in many ways, when we look at all those actions we need to take for the future, we see that actually the future is not that far. There are so many things uh, we need to do. Uh, we need to do uh, research, develop science, technology. We need to find um, means in order to finance these activities, for example. We need to regulate this environment. We need to develop necessary skills and capacities. And all these things, of course, take time. So planning, action, and implementation are very important elements of foresight. Foresight without action is not foresight. So it needs to give some clear uh, hints and clear recommendations and proposals to policymakers and strategy makers so that they can act. And then we look at those actions time to time, look at their impacts and see if we are really achieving our targets and our visions. And where necessary, we sit and try to modify them, revise them because situations continuously change. So we may need to revise them in order to fit and then revitalize our visions and goals for the future. 
And this is a continuous cycle, of course. It is very important that we create this foresight culture and forward-looking culture. In many foresight exercises, we try to bring different stakeholders together because foresight is an interactive process. We try to bring together researchers, uh, scientists, policymakers, uh, academics, society, and at the same time, industry. But we understand that it's actually not enough only to bring them together. Foresight is a great platform for enabling this future-oriented conversation, but we also understand that we need to go to them also and bring foresight into their day-to-day -day activities and day-to-day -day thinking. This is what I will term uh, later as foresight on site. So in our book, we explain and elaborate all these steps with necessary methods. So you can see in this star, there are a number of quantitative and qualitative methods. These are for guidance, and you may choose and combine them in different ways to fulfill different functions of foresight in terms of understanding trends, designing alternative futures, articulating them to build visions, and translating those visions into strategies and acting upon them. So you see a set of uh, methods in the book and we try to illustrate this. So we are really hoping that this will help you and everyone else, all the readers basically, to um, plan their futures and then to basically uh, find their own answers from their own point of views. So thank you very much. So I hand it to Alexander now, hand it over. Uh, good morning, good morning everybody. I would like to share my screen as well. Uh, just a moment, yes. Okay, so uh, in my in my talk, first of all, I would like to share my appreciation with the with all efforts of uh, our Brazilian Brazilian uh, friends uh, uh, with this book, in the, especially to Walder, who, who made an excellent translation, and he he, he made he asked so many questions while while translating the, the, the book, so. It's uh, for us. It seems uh, very important that the person who really uh, within the, the process did, did this excellent work. So, in my in my um, in my short presentation, I would like to to describe how foresight is linked to decision strategies, policy actions. Um, uh, actually, uh, as Ocean just mentioned, that foresight without action is not f foresight. So, uh, really. Uh, foresight should be in, embedded in, in, in policy making and policy in, implementation. Uh, so we, we see that a lot of new challenges are, are are emerging for science policy, for innovation policy. They, they, they are connected with selectivity, which feels support and how much focus to, to give priorities, uh, how, how to balance between thematic priorities and social economic objectives, how to how which institutions or research teams to support. And how much to support them, uh, how to establish a sustainable system where where all resources are re renewed, and um, uh, what should be the framework uh, conditions, how they should facilitate innovation development, uh, how to to provide mobility of knowledge, people, money, services, business, everything, and uh, what what governance is needed. So we, we have a lot of issues to, to be to be addressed within the uh, science technology innovation for foresight studies. Uh, for policies, uh, actually, uh, mm, uh, policy-related functions of foresight, they include first informing policy, uh, which is related to open participation, engagement of key, key experts and key stakeholders, building joint visions, uh, scenarios, uh, mobilize people, to, to be engaged in foresight. Second is policy f f facilitating when uh, when policy is implemented and uh, realized. So foresight helps to co coordinate joint actions. And p policy advice where where uh, the results of foresight, uh, foresight are 
uh, are implemented into interpretation or individual strategies for different uh, areas. Uh, excuse me. Excuse me, I don't know my slide. Uh, okay. Uh, but f f foresight is also uh, needed for, f for business, and we see the growing need uh, for, from business for foresight study. Uh, one of the st studies uh, showed that um, a lot of uh, a lot of organizations uh, uh, mostly look straight forward, and they 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 are not able to to look uh, around and see what which which uh, issues m might be relevant for for the future organization. Uh, uh, most of people uh, are surprised by uh, high impact e events uh, which, which, uh, which have a great influence on their businesses. And then most of uh, companies, they lack early warning system to, to prevent such surprises in, in the future, which uh, shows that uh, foresight is uh, really one of the instruments which might be very helpful for uh, for not only for policy makers but for businesses also. Uh, as for uh, using science technology uh, innovation foresight results, who and why sh should use this? Uh, they, there are multiple users. Uh, government can search for objective criteria to select priorities for support fine-tune the existing instruments and build up uh, new ones, uh, in, uh, involve business and society um, to, 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 to make the policy process more open. Um, they eliminate, eliminate barriers between different ministries. So th this is uh, one of the areas where foresight is helpful. For uh, research institutions, it shows uh, future research agenda and uh, uh, um, helps to integrate into global research space. For universities, is also it also shows the new research agenda. Uh, it helps to build a development strategy and helps to to revise educational programs with, with respect to, to the future. What will be needed in the future in the next five, ten, fifteen years? For regions, it's also uh, helpful to build innovation clusters or to identify smart specialization for, 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 for the region. Uh, for, uh, for large businesses, for companies, it helps to develop long-term strategies to, to provide technological modernization on the basis of uh, latest technological achievements and integrate to, into global uh, value chains. Uh, also, it's important for society. Uh, for society, um, new build new new models of behavior. Uh, it shows how the consumer preferences are changed. The people's values are changed as well. So it shows how society uh, should be addressed. Societal issues should be addressed. For small and medium enterprises, it also uh, helps to identify new markets and emerging technological uh, opportunities. It helps also to develop institutions, to uh, build an uh, innovation environment, to, to, um, to create communication platforms, to, um, to facilitate joint projects and initiatives from different players. Uh, just a moment. Mm -hmm. So uh, the uh, so the global uh, global ch ch challenges uh, uh, sh show how the the different issues sh should be addressed uh, in their in their c c c complexity. So when uh, when we, we do foresight studies, we analyze uh, different issues: social, economic, policy. Technological, environmental, and the values which are which are also ch changed, as I mentioned, and uh, this is also an important uh, point when you uh, when you do um, uh, foresight study. 
Uh, for this is an example of uh, from Japanese foresight. You can see that for different areas, uh, different issues are more important. Uh, issues related to human built in human resources, or investing more money, or provide collaboration, or building uh, re regulation and uh, facilitate the environment which will help to develop individual areas. Uh, also, uh, foresight gives you um, uh, an evidence-based um, uh, picture of the future. So if you, you look from different sides, from the uh, side of uh, science and technology, or environment, or economy, or society, you can see, you can combine events which will define the future. Some of them are already there, already happened. Some are planned to, 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 to be uh, to happen in, in the near future. And all this sh show you a big picture and the policy makers and the not only policy, policy makers, but broad, broad audience can, can can judge what might, uh, what, what might uh, happen in the future and what are most interesting developments which sh should, be, uh, should be taken in, in, into account. Uh, uh, also, uh, we, uh, for foresight, gives them a background for uh, new projects and investments. And it, it works like this. So uh, on the basis of foresight, we identify key, uh, key challenges, key markets, emerging markets, and how the existing markets will be changed, uh, how, uh, which products, technologies, and the uh, research and development uh, will, be, will be defining the, the, the future. On this basis, the priorities are identified. And these uh, priorities uh, show you uh, which areas should be addressed, which critical technologies for, for the industry, for society are most important. And uh, the key instrument we, we use to, to, uh, to, to, to build uh, real actions are the technology roadmaps. I will show you a bit how they, they look like. And uh, uh, these technology roadmaps show you the uh, instruments for implementation of, uh, of uh, results of foresight studies. And of course, this is a cyclical process and uh, it should be, uh, the results should be monitored and evaluated and repeated again and again and again. And uh, this uh, gives you a background for better policies. Uh, the uh, roadmaps, uh, look, uh, this is one of the examples of roadmaps. They are built from right to left. So you identify first future markets, future products which will be in demand in, in this market. Uh, uh, what, what, uh, how the manufacturing sh should be built, which research and development results are needed. But it, uh, it's implemented from left to, to right. So you identify, should you import the technologies or should you develop your own uh, technology on the base your domestic uh, research and development, which requirements uh, are needed for, for, for technologies, uh, how to, to build a technology chain for products manufacturing, which products uh, might, be, might be developed on the basis of, uh, of new technology and how they, they, they should be placed in, into, in, in, the, in the market. So the, this is uh, one of the instruments uh, which is widely used and we use it very intensively for in our um, in our work with the businesses. And uh, my last slide, probably, it's very important to, uh, to address future skills because uh, uh, foresight gives you a background, science, technology, innovation foresight in particular, show you, shows you which technologies, which, uh, which areas are, will be uh, most demanded in the future. But without uh, human resources, well-educated and the, uh, equipped with the skills in this respect, uh, the the progress will, will not be will not be feasible. So this is also one of the most important issues, and uh, which which should be addressed within the foresight studies. So um, this stage, uh, I will stop my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Alexander Sokolov, Dr. Oskan Saritas, and Dr. Ian Miles. 
Now we're going to have our chat and exchange. I want to turn the floor over to Valdileia Veloso to make her observations and comments on the three authors' presentations. And then Juliano, and we're going to do this exchange now. And recalling that the roundtable was proposed for us to proceed. Before we proceed, the book is an eminently technical book. But they, there's a presentation, and there's a difference between the book, the original book, there's an introduction to the Brazilian edition where they discuss the recommendation from Foresight and that the adoption or non-adoption in official policies. We set up the roundtable on the one hand for the Foresight researchers of the book and our decision makers here in Brazil, policymakers, Juliana and Valdele, who are on the front line of decisions here at, at Fio Cruz related to the pandemic. So I'd like to uh, this, make this aside now for Valdele and to proceed with the debate, which promises to be exciting. So thank you for the introduction and the presentation was fantastic and gave us the perspective of the book and the potential for this, for a foresight, something that Valdu is saying uh, for the decision makers, it's extremely important. And I think it is a point also here at Fio Cruz is that we do both things actually uh, there's no decision makers isolated on one side we're doing the work participating in foresight and studying the future and thinking of the future together at the end of course there are the decision makers the final decision makers but at least here in our institution there's a collective process in decision-making. It's essentially collective decision-making here. Something which I, the point that I would like to hear from you on is this issue of the collective process. So I think this process strengthens the institution, this collective process beyond strengthening the institution The process itself, per se, the elaboration of the futures and the discussion, in a sense, is also brings the culture that nothing is static, nothing is predetermined, and that we need to be prepared to adapt and act in different scenarios. I think that this happened, it actually happened now with the COVID-19 pandemic, which led to a number of changes. And the fact that we used this methodology in our strategic planning also contributed for our institute to be better prepared to confront for our community in the institute to tackle this adverse situation, which was happened, appeared, it happened, which wasn't, we were in a scenario that things were not going so well in the country before, even economically and politically, but we had a scenario, unexpected scenario. We had predicted an epidemic and the discussions, they contributed to integrating the group and how to act. So this, I believe, is also very important as a product it's uh, the methodology and thinking of the future jointly helped us to make i'd like to ask a question for you all in this direction which is something that has i have wondered about how to integrate foresight and society how to integrate society into foresight work 
in a sense here in Brazil, there's huge inequality in Brazilian society. To what extent people who are the decision makers, the technical experts, the researchers and the physicians, how can they bring foresight and include the majority of the Brazilian population in this process? Because, because of the huge inequality here, people's training that are discussing the future, it's different. Foresight is different. How do you view this? Do you work on this issue of, in the book, but in greater detail, in greater depth, I'd like to hear you about how you do this, integrating society into foresight work. In the workshop, on our work, there's even inequality of opportunities to speak and understand. And to, in our workshop, people have the knowledge in our Institute of Infectious Disease, we always work that all of the people have their own knowledge, their different knowledges, and they're all important. But how can we encourage and stimulate and find a way for people to be able to express themselves and that we can also hear them properly and hear them, not in a condescending sense that they're as we're doing them a favor. Okay, we're giving you an opportunity to be in this wonderful research environment, but as the protagonists themselves, fundamental protagonists on an equal footing, knowing that we have different forms of knowledge. What can you comment on that? Who would like to answer? Ian, Oscan, Alexander, all three. It's a great question. Uh, I'll just say a few words. Um, and yes, it, it is a great question. And uh, it's a difficult question. And one that is not getting any easier um, as we're developing very sophisticated tools. Um, like you know, computer simulation tools and so on that can require a great deal of understanding, um, uh, you know, a great deal of expertise to understand them. And uh, one problem is that many people will you know, treat the results of these tools as um, uh, you know almost God given. You know, they're really, really authoritative um, uh, conclusions. Where, uh, which have come from the computer um, and are therefore, you know, um, not a product of um, political choice or social interests or anything like that. And that is that is a big problem, um, and one which I think we have to confront by, um, you know, uh, helping to make uh, all sorts of people um, much more literate. Uh, about the fact that you know uh, scientific techniques uh, are very rigorous um, and when they are applied well uh, are giving results uh, that need to be taken seriously but that they are also always limited um, and that scientists themselves you know, have their own baggage their own interests, their own limitations. Um, so we need to be able to interpret um, these results. That's, we, with the book, we, we try to do this, but of course the book is written already for um, an audience of people that are highly educated. And many people um, uh, don't, will not have access uh, to it. So yes, there is a very big problem here. Uh, now, it seems to me that there are ways of um, dialogue which can bring in much more of the population. Um, so, for example, um, one of the um, cities in the UK recently had a foresight exercise on its future. Um, and this involved having, um, among other things, some exhibitions uh, in museums, art galleries, and elsewhere, um, that help to uh, people to visualize some of the alternatives that were being discussed. 
some of the possibilities that could be confronted. Um, and I've seen other people um, be even more imaginative than this. Um, so uh, there has been one theatre group um, that actually doesn't just uh, give you a scenario and ask you to respond to that scenario. That can be very good. You know, the, I guess most of us saw the film Contagion about a pandemic, which came out a few years ago. And, you know, it was very good forecasting, um, very limited in some ways, but still it had a lot of things right. Um, and, uh, and you can be presented with a scenario like that and then discuss that. And that is valuable. Um, but this particular theatre group was going around schools uh, and it engaged the school children in developing their own scenarios uh, around future technology developments. And in this case, um, the case that I, I'm familiar with, um, it was technology around uh, genomics and genetic engineering. Um, and uh, in the performance I saw, uh, the children had made their own play up, um, which was about school children in a future where most people, um, as parents, had chosen their offspring so that they didn't have um, susceptibility to common colds and flu and diseases that most people have. Um, and in the drama that they, these children developed, they had one child who was a traditional baby, had been a traditional baby, didn't didn't have any of these characteristics. And so, and it was depicting how she um, might be relating to the um, enhanced people uh, uh, that, that were around her. Um, and that was, to my mind, great. I mean, it also, it gave me lots to think about. Um, it gave the kids lots to think about. Um, uh, and they learned both about you know, some of the technologies and possible trends and trajectories there and about um, you know, some of the social choices and the implications of those choices um, that they could confront. So, you know, that is just one tool. Um, but I was very, very impressed um, by you know, the um, creativity, you know, both of the theatre group and of the children that they engaged with um, in in being able to th really think about the future and realize an image of future possibilities much better um, than you know, the traditional um, thing that in, 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 in a lot of planning in this country, there has been consultation with the public. And that consultation is very, very restricted. The public are given um, uh, a, a, a statement of the problem, then they're given two or three options and asked which one they prefer. Not very good. This was much more um, active and creative. So um, I, I'm not saying it's the, the solution, but it seems to me that there are ways of engaging much more of the population into dialogue um, and that we actually we can learn from this dialogue as well. Uh, if you allow, I can add a little bit uh, about about this. Yeah, actually, uh, as far as uh, science technology innovation foresight is concerned, it's uh, sometimes it's difficult to to bring in a very broad uh, broad uh, audience to to, to 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 be engaged. But what what we we did, for example, we we, we do regularly sociological polls about um, attention of a population to science and technology, the different issues, uh, ethical issues or new technologies which are, which are more uh, better accepted or uh, worse accepted. Uh, this is one point. Another point is that uh, I have an example. We, we recently did a big foresight study for science and technology innovation in South Africa, uh, jointly with Ocean. And uh, they, they asked us after, after we finished it, they said, we, we, we need to look more thoroughly uh, at um, some uh, issues which are relevant for South Africa, like, like inequality or, or different issues. 
and then what what we did we analyzed hundreds of uh, sources of information uh, statistical information first of all and then analyzed different indicators and we found which of them are uh, more more relevant to South Africa which are less relevant in the it, it helped a lot us so in the, uh, we also uh, made a kind of cross a cross analysis between these uh, indicators and and the technologies which technologies will contribute to to uh, overcoming existing problems maybe to c contribute somehow this is also very helpful uh, another point is uh, we have i didn't mention it but we have in our institute a very powerful uh, system of semantic analysis of big data we have more than 500 million documents there and we we also analyze uh, social networks there and so we from this analysis we also we also identify some issues which are which are uh, which are relevant for ordinary people and uh, which might help us to better understand how science and technology innovation can contribute to uh, to uh, to um, bridging the, the gaps between between different p p people to decrease inequality and so on so these are a few examples uh, how how it might be tackled this issue um i can also add a few words on the top um well i think uh, the uh, question raised by uh, by the Leo is a very important one and it's very deep rooted uh, in terms of how our societies and policy making culture are organized so uh, basically there are uh, two main issues um, we have serious uh, problems in terms of trust and uh, transparency so um, at the moment for example uh, there's a big um, gap between policy making and society and there's also the side of uh, scientists for example in many cases we see that uh, they are there in their own world so policy makers are in their own silo society and its own silo and scientists are in their own silo and industries are also their own silo so there's a gap between all this and so and all these parties unfortunately have some sort of histories uh, and very good reasons for not to trust <laughs> to each other so uh, society has very big doubts about policy makers for example because they are thinking about their own interests and industry doesn't have a very good background in many cases in terms of their exploitive kind of thinking so they are exploiting our resources and human resources, natural resources, and so on. And the, in the same way, uh, science and academia are very much engaged in their curiosity-driven problems, which uh, frequently uh, don't relate to um, the society's immediate concerns or expectations. So first of all, I think we should uh, try to find some ways to overcome these barriers and to build this trust. So how we can make sure that, for example, society can trust the policymakers and can ensure that the policymakers are thinking about their future, the future of the society instead of their own individual or personal futures. And how science universities and academia are again addressing society's issues and grand challenges and what sorts of uh, solutions they are finding for that. And the same way the industry, how industry is becoming more responsible for society, for environment, then correcting their image, if you like. So there are uh, serious issues in terms of trust and transparency. So in foresight, we try to overcome, at least in a modest way, of uh, these problems uh, by bringing all these parties uh, together, all these stakeholders together around a platform where they can sit together and discuss and exchange their views. So if we can achieve, for example, uh, to bring together policymakers, society, industrialists, researchers, and other uh, related uh, parties around the same platform and give them an opportunity to talk to each other 
and exchange their views and understand each other mutually, then this will be a great first step to begin um, in terms of building trust and then discuss a common future uh, so that people can feel that actually this is for the benefit of the country or it, this is for the benefit of their city or region. So we can experiment this at different levels. I mean, maybe not immediately at the national level, but some small exercise and steps can be taken at the local levels, for example, where we can start building this trust and make the policy making processes, for example, more transparent and not necessarily in top down ways, but in bottom up kind of a fashion where people and society can feel that they had an opportunity to shape the policy so they can understand the rationals behind the policy. So these are very important steps. So first of all, in order to build some successful futures and visions, we need to overcome these problems. And of course, we have some instruments for this, and we try to describe this in the book. Some of these is basically with the direct interaction with all these parties and bringing them together physically, sometimes accessing them in their own places, so going to them instead of bringing them, so, uh, and then visiting them in their own context and systems and understanding actually their points by observing and understanding them. Or sometimes we try to use the power of data as Alexander has just mentioned. And we look at the tendencies, overall discussions, agendas, and try to understand what are those points that society is concerned what are those developments in science and technology? What are the expectations of policy and how we can bring this together? But again, the key questions are very much related to trust and transparency and foresight can provide some modest steps to build this between all the stakeholders. We got it. Thank you very much. That was excellent. Thank you very much, Vajade. Are you happy? You're happy with the answers, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. Juliana, do you have any questions that you'd like to raise? I would like to very briefly, Vajade, make a few comments and for us to be able to have an opportunity to interact with the audience concerning some issues. But I also want to thank the this, uh, summary of this wealth, the book that is being launched today, but the talks by Ian Oskan and Dr. Sokolov objectively summarized the global project, the overall project of the book. I want to highlight three points very briefly. The first, uh, calling attention and the emphasis given to the need of systemic thinking. In other words, my assessment is that this book should be conceived more as a contribution to uh, foresight thinking rather than uh, not more than even the instruments, which are obviously very useful, but in the absence of an understanding, a systemic understanding, they, become, they would become a fetish. So this is one of the main contributions the contribution to systemic thinking, which includes a set of other elements. I always joke by saying that it doesn't do any good to do any kind of effort or in planning based on foresight approach. If you don't have an understanding of your mission, for example, it's elementary, but considering your mission, or for what the, why the institution exists, what, who it serves, and what kind of effects does it intend to have on society. Without that understanding of your own mission, any search to incorporate tools, the book gets excellent examples of instruments. They would become instruments in and of themselves, almost a fetish. And it's no co coincidence that one of the central elements in our discussion here is how to permeate 
foresight in decision making, how to have foresight interweave with and in being taken into account by decision makers. Some of the elements are precise at the basis, the absence of a systemic understanding of the mission, the role of the institution or organization. They are crucial for us to make proper use of foresight and its tools. So this is highlighted in the book because they emphasize and this warning and alert says, I'm saying this for our future readers because it's very common in our field, at least in the field that I belong to, planning to have some bedazzlement with the method. And then we like to have all the rest revolve around that bedazzlement. And so this is the first aspect. The method serves a purpose and it has to be has that kind of relationship. That's one aspect that I want to highlight in the book. The second aspect that I want to highlight is the idea that's related to the first is foresight as the author of organizational learning precisely because of its participatory thrust in foresight activity, joining people together to build alternative paths with a view towards building the desirable future generates, spawns learning, uh, places people in dialogue and makes the institution develop. The example of our own Institute of Infectious Diseases, I will cite very quickly, the Institute, when it did its planning, when it did that exercise of projecting the Zika Zira, a uh, theoretical rhetorical exercise of a theoretical pandemic, a large scale pandemic, did an exercise. This led in the institution as a whole an understanding of what was necessary to do and what were the deficiencies to face this future th threat or pandemic. And curiously, some of these deficiencies, for example, the healthcare infrastructure ended up being unlocked during the COVID-19 pandemic based on a rapid response thought conceived in 50 days but and implemented. But without that previous basis with the exercise that we did, to, which allowed that understanding, certainly one of the responses given by the Institute in the pandemic would not have happened. So I wanted to highlight the second aspect. And finally, the relationship between policy making, decision making, and the role of experts or specialists we normally state, we, I say, my, I'm including myself, we place great emphasis on this incapacity, so to speak, of politicians and decision makers in thinking in the long term and other interests which hinder this kind of exercise. But I would like to invert the direction of the exercise and analyze the specialists themselves. I normally say that if we turn all the policy making over to the experts, the world would be a chaos because if we left that up to them, because this policy making is by definition, by nature, it results from a number of variables, actors, stakeholders, amongst whom it includes the specialists, but not limited to them. If we put these specialists at the center of the discussions, I really fear what may happen. So I believe that there's a need also to revise for us to re we specialists to review the way that we approach the decision makers, the policy makers, and how we seek a more uh, comprehensive understanding, which is what I think that you contribute with the book. So I wish to highlight these three points and thank you for the opportunity to have the book here available in Brazil and Portuguese. And I wish to say that Oscan, you'll have much more than one reader, many more than one reader here in Brazil. Won't just be one of this book in Brazilian Portuguese. Don't worry, it won't be just one. So we've heard Juliano Lima. Feel free to weigh in and respond to the beautiful provocations that was goading people into commenting. I would just like to say that I would love to see an account of the Zika Zero exercise written up, written up and presented in, in English, ideally, but not, 
But now we have a, such a great translator that might not be needed. But this sounds to me like a really good experience, which a lot of lessons could be learned from um, and would be you know, very good to um, disseminate the knowledge of it more, more widely. I'd, previously, I only knew of it because Valdia had told me about it, um, but it, it should be much better known. Yeah, well, I also oh, uh, would like to say that uh, we are always at your disposal, uh, basically, to discuss this, um, you know, ideas further and maybe move on with some uh, initiatives. Uh, so this is a great beginning, I think. Of course, uh, the book gives an opportunity, um, as um, Giuliano said, to access to a wider audience with many more uh, readers. Um, but any other initiative, for example, to bring this into life will be very much appreciated and supported uh, by us. Uh, because th this is, I think, we should really start this conversation and move it beyond the conversation and, the, you know, with an action, as we say. So I, I, I hope this will be a great bridge between, the, you know, this uh, kind of theory and the information, knowledge, and experience, and then bring it to real life with some actions and real impacts, for example. Um, today we are talking about this pandemic, but uh, there are all sorts of other things which may arise uh, in the future. So, uh, as you said, uh, Giuliano, we live in a very big system, and all the parts of this system are very much uh, interconnected and interrelated. So today we are going through a crisis which was triggered by the health uh, system as such. But tomorrow we may have, for example, other problems triggered by, for example, climate issues or economic issues. And they may have some implications for health. Uh, for example, in a, a project we did uh, with uh, Ian a few years back in Manchester, we were talking about personal health systems, and we had an opportunity to see how, for example, climate change would bring a lot of new diseases. And maybe COVID-19 is part of them also. So this might also uh, be triggered by all this climate change. And also not only climate change, like how the uh, international system economic system, for example, transportation and logistics systems and networks are established. So we saw, for example, a very quick um, transfer of this virus across the world. So how we can um, understand these dynamics, for example, because people are traveling everywhere and not only people are traveling, but also goods are traveling and there are global value chains and everything is connected and there's this bigger picture and we should definitely investigate in this to understand um, because it's not only important what triggered the problem but it is also important what caused this to become a major global crisis and it could be triggered by anything else in the future but how we can take some actions to make sure that this don't become such large scale crisis globally and affect all of us uh, in the end. Uh, if you allow, I can add a few words. Uh, I, I just wanted to, to tell you, by the way, that uh, we in our uh, institute, our Foresight Center, we organize uh, every year a big uh, event. In the, this year, it will be in half part of October. Uh, and um, so it will be a c conference on uh, uh, foresight and this type of policy. Uh, you are kindly invited. I will send Valder the information about about the, the conference. If you if you would be interested to to make a presentation about your studies there, we would be happy. By the way, we organize every year a special within this uh, conference. We organize every year a special session devoted to foresight in BRICS countries. So Brazil is one of the one of BRICS uh, countries, 
and we invite people from South Africa, from China, from India. This year, we also will will organize this, uh, this event. So you are kindly invited. And also, we we've been discussing actually for years already to to organize something like a, a science technology foresight for BRICS for BRICS countries. Why don't we think about this uh, as an opportunity? Because we have a lot of uh, a lot of cooperation, and uh, we know each other uh, very well. With people who 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 does uh, foresight in uh, all countries, and so we would be happy actually to to be engaged in close collaboration with Fio Cruz, but not only with more Brazilian Brazilians uh, in this respect. Thank you very much, Alexander Sokolov. Thank you all. We're basically running out of time. In a few minutes, we still have a few more minutes, but I think we could perhaps move on to adjourning now. Giuliano, if you'd like to say a few. I know that we have other questions, but I, the, with an hour and a half of discussion, we have basically uh, run the course, so to speak. If you all agree, I'll ask Giuliano Lima to say a few words and final comments, and then Valdele will close the round table with the closing remarks. Valdele. So, Giuliano, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Valdir. In your kind words, I wish to emphasize against our gratitude for the opportunity that we've had to hold this debate and to meet Ian, Oscan, and Alexander promoting this collaboration, which is extremely important to say that this initiative of translating the book into Brazilian Portuguese is part of a broader project allowing decision makers in the field of science, technology, and innovation, and few Cruz as the institution today, which is a central institution in this field, to ha have available to us tools and approaches which expand our capacity to build a future that we wish for with more equality in a future where science and health and education are truly at the basis of the country's development. And we want to thank the contribution by you all, and especially Valdir for having made this, having done this translation and making it available to all of us in Brazilian Portuguese. So thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you, Juliana. Valdelea, I wish to thank again you all for the opportunity to join together today discussing not only the book and foresight, but a common vision that we have with regard to how to build a future collectively. This more than ever before is extremely important. We're experiencing a time now of great individual individuality and uh, immediate thinking and collective construction is more essential than ever. The book contributes to disseminating this foresight culture and to train people, interested people will be able to read the book. There's a, I read the summary in the, uh, the field, foresight field, uh, the knowledge, systematized knowledge. This will help people to awaken their interest, people's interest who act in planning and people who are have a more constant participation, so to speak, in life and institutional. They won't necessarily be planners, but they're not necessarily going to be policy makers or decision makers in institutions, but it's going to allow them to interact better based on reading the book that you've shared so generously with us. And I would really like to move forward and collaborate more. As was mentioned, it would be great to have another 
the possibility for this collaboration between that has emerged with Valdir Ermita for us to move forward further with it and to have more opportunities for our Institute of Infectious Diseases and for Brazil as a whole as well that we can collaborate in. And so I also want to thank Valdir and congratulate him for taking this initiative of doing, uh, holding this event and for having done such a, a, a excellent translation of such an important book and having it in our own language will facilitate uh, reading it. Thank you, Valdelea. Okay. We have a question here from the audience. When you were closing the event, if you agree, I'm gonna read the question and then we'll actually finalize. So, Ana Lucia Feitosa said, how to guarantee that the elements built by the future studies will influence the capacity to for monitoring that's more permeable to uh, daily activity by organizations in a live and interactive dynamic. I'm going to open up and read it slowly to facilitate the simultaneous translation. So I'll read the question again. How to guarantee that the elements built by futures study include the capacity to monitor more permeable monitoring of the daily activity by organizations? Have you heard the question? Would anyone like to weigh in? It's, if I understood the question, how to bring elements into the daily activities of organizations to monitor decisions that are made, like policy decisions and actions that were defined in workshops and planning and everything. How, what about the daily implementation of and monitoring of them in the implementation of the actions, how to guarantee that actions built, that they influence the capacity for daily monitoring by organizations. Well, very briefly, uh, I don't think there are any guarantees, unfortunately. Um, but what is important is to build into our routines the habit of relating what we are currently engaged in to, to longer-term futures, to our overall objectives, ambitions, motivations, um, in terms of making uh, a, a, a livable and a better future. Um, now, it's very easy to get caught up in the immediate tasks and forget about the broader picture. So we have to build, find ways of building in routines which enable us to look at this broader picture. And probably the best routines are ones that involve several people in dialogue on a regular basis. And this is actually what I termed the earlier as foresight on site. So um, what I meant was not to bring only the stakeholders into the process of foresight, but also bringing foresight into their daily routines um, and building their futures literacy, for example. Uh, communicating with them that there's a future, there are a lot of uncertainties and complexities within that future, and they can actually do something about this future. They can plan it, they can develop some course of action, they can understand uh, the trends, for example, in society, in technology, in economy, politics and environment, values and culture. And when they do their activities, day-to-day -day activities, so they can keep this big picture in front of them and can actually um, future-proof uh, their ideas and see how this is relevant, for example, to social trends economic trends, environmental trends. For example, uh, there's a, a process, we are talking about artificial intelligence and all sorts of technological development. Now uh, I have a conversation with another group in the US, for example, and this is a group of uh, neuroscientists. And what I'm trying to communicate to them is that um, 
they should have this big picture uh, view right from the beginning. Scientists should develop some technologies which are actually responsible and they consider uh, cultural, legal aspects, standards, and all the kind of, uh, you know, broader impacts of their technologies. For example, also uh, nanotechnology developers have been thinking about it. So how to address society's concerns, for example, right from the beginning, because there's a great concern for nanotechnologies, genetically modified, for example, crops, and artificial intelligence and the others. So all the concerns of the society should be addressed from the beginning. All the aspects related to culture, regulations, law, standards should be addressed right from the beginning. So this is why we need to bring foresight into the daily routines of all these uh, stakeholders. So I think, and then when they do their activities, so they won't invest in some areas, for example, which may create some harms for the society in the future. So they can find better solutions for any uh, activities they are engaged in and any decisions they make. Uh, I would add, I would add one, one very, very simple thing. Actually, uh, all this is uh, very good, but uh, what, what is extremely important is to engage stakeholders, stakeholders from the very beginning from the very, very beginning in, in discussions, uh, because uh, otherwise they will not, when, when they engage it in the, in the end of the process, they do not, uh, do not consider the results of foresight as their own, uh, their own work. And uh, this is very important, that everybody should be a holder of foresight study and should share, share the result, what, 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 what has been done there. In this respect, in this case, they will be, uh, they will be eager. They will eager be eager to 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 implement it. This is important. Actually, I have a phrase for that, which is the uh, designing scientifically possible, economically feasible, and socially desirable futures. So we should think about all this possibility, feasibility, and desirability at the same time. Yeah. Ok, gente, acho que conseguimos é, aproveitar. So, I think we've uh, taken great advantage of the time. I'll turn the floor over to Paul Lira, who's our technical support person. Paul Lira, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Ok. Wonderful. You have the floor now. Thank you, everyone. Again. To our guest speakers, the authors of this wonderful book, and the uh, experts from Fiocruz and Paulina, the technical person. Well, then, can I just make a small point before we go? So, oh, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, actually, I want to thank you uh, for this great initiative once again, and everybody in here for their efforts. And I'm really hoping that with your effort, in translating this book into Portuguese and Brazilian, the impact of it will go beyond the uh, borders of Brazil to all other uh, <laughs> Portuguese-speaking uh, countries. So uh, particularly to Mozambique, 